Good morning, everyone. It's Thursday, December 19th, and let's get into it. We've got a lot of data from the Fed. I should have done this report in about six minutes, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost convinced that these numbers are not going to be out of sight of estimates. Why? Because the range has been predictable. The four-week four moving average has been around 224,000. We had a little, little uh, outlier last week at 252, but the truth of the matter is we're pretty much on par. And with employment data and with the GDP tomorrow, I don't think things are going to be out of line. It doesn't look like it. There's no major swings in either direction. Anyhow, if the number is right on par, anywhere between 200,000 and say 240,000, 245,000, I don't think it's gonna be a major deal. Other reports we have today, the big reports, we have existing home sales and we have leading indicators, which is a private consensus. But quite honestly, the jobless claim is gonna be a big one and I don't think it's gonna have a big impact on anything unless it's really out of whack. Why? Because tomorrow we have GDP the biggest report of the week, and consumer sentiment. Now, let's talk about the GDP. This is really important because this sets the tone. Consensus, 2.1. Truth be told, the reason consensus is 2.1 instead of 2 is because hopes were higher than expected. The expectations got heated up, and they decided to make it 2.1. But the truth of the matter is, as far as the market's concerned, anything, and this is why the consensus is between 1.9 and 2.1, because 2 is really the target. 2.1 is gravy between us, between us here, 2.1 is gravy. 2.0 is just fine. This is the big number. This is what Wall Street's waiting for, and I don't think we're going to see a lot of volatility unless something really drastic happens today. The focus in the market, the focus in the market switched from China and U.S. to impeachment. It really did switch, but the problem is or I don't know if it's a problem or not, it doesn't look like impeachment is going anywhere. Um, you've, got, you've got too many Republicans that are going to say no soup. So I don't think that's going to go anywhere. The market is not assimilating it at all. But, I, and I told you, I'm going to show you something, and I told you I would keep you abreast of this on a daily basis. Another day goes by, look at the Russell yesterday. Up 0.32, 19.19%. S&P 500 yesterday, 0.1, and the Dow negative, which means you're still seeing the technology, the impact from the small chips from China and U.S. resolving their differences, at least temporarily, hopefully forever. It's, it's being priced into the tech sector, which is why you're seeing technology still lead. But check this out. Remember consumer discretionary? Remember I told you they're going to come together the, the consumer discretionary and technology should be next to each other. Well, two weeks ago, consumer discretionary was right here. It was near where energy is and industrial. So it's moving up and technology is not falling. What I predict will happen is technology will go a little bit south and consumer discretionary will stay here and they'll meet in the middle. But let me tell you what's really bothering me right now, really bothering me. This is the NASDAQ 100. This is the percentage of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average. And the number right now, it went, it went up even higher yesterday. It was around 82. It's now at 86. This is the upper end of the range. Look at this. And this is two years. This isn't two days. This isn't two weeks. This isn't two months. This is two years. Look at this. Every time we go into this area, every time we go into this area, we come down. Every time we dip into this area, we come down. And if, if it comes down to here, right here, this will put the NASDAQ 100 at the 200-day moving average. Maybe, actually, maybe over here, a little closer to here. This will put it at 50-day moving average for sure. So, again, right here, right here, right here, and now right here. And the RSI is also catching overbought. That's the biggest thing that's bothering me right now. That and the divergence that we're seeing. This divergence that we're seeing right here is no good. You're seeing, you're seeing the RSI not being able to match the price levels, which is telling us momentum, which is telling us that the stock, that the asset, the ETF in this case, is running out of momentum because momentum levels can't keep up with price. And 
These two factors, these two factors are very, very important. As a matter of fact, they're the most important two factors that I'm looking at right now. The fact that the Dow Jones is coming off a little bit, not a big deal. The fact that um, the Russell is outperforming the S&P, it's significant, but it's expected. But technical divergence, and look here, where if you look at the S&P, let's say you don't trade small caps, look at the S&P, same thing. You've got this divergence. And divergence typically resolves, resolves itself within a few weeks or a month. It doesn't take a long time. Now, let's talk about something important. Are we talking about a major downside, a major correction? No, no. We're talking taking us down to the 50-day average, maybe a little bit below, which I would like to see. Why would I like to see it? Because the more downside we get, the more in line these sectors are going to get. They're fragmented right now, and I want to see them. Um, I want to see them tight and moving in a rhythm. Because when the markets, when the sectors are all all over the place as, as they are right now. It doesn't set a good tone for the overall market and it causes a lot less volatility. It causes less institutional accumulation. It causes a lot of thing, a lot less price action moving into the market. So let's take a look. Let's see if the numbers, ah, here we go. In real time. So the number, the number came out in time with, in line, not in time. It's early folks, it's only 8.30 here. I remember, I'm used to waking up Pacific Zone. I just moved here less than a year and a half ago to Florida. I'm from California. It's uh, 5.30 in the morning. This is when I would actually wake up in LA um, because I was tr I've was i always been trading the New York futures markets and the New York futures markets open at about 5.20 in the market. 5.20 in the morning, not market. Market, but 5.20 in the morning. <laughs> All right, we're at 234,000. We're in line with consensus. Let's look at let's look at um, let's look at bonds. How about that? Let's see if there's any. I, I'm willing to bet there's very little. Let's see here. Let's look at one day. Yeah, doesn't look like we we've gone really very far at all. If anything, let's look at the five minute chart. Yep, nothing. This is a five minute chart of one day intraday. See that? In line, and this is what I keep telling you, don't worry about the actual number. I don't even worry, I, I never even look at the actual number. I look at the consensus range. And if the number is within the consensus range, it's doing fine. Now, notice no reaction from the bond market. You know what, let's take a look at the futures market. Let's see if the futures market is, let's see here, financials, here we go. Let's look at the futures, which have been open now for a while. See, I like to do this in real time with you so we can kind of catch the market at the same time. There's no volatility for December anymore. We gotta move into um, March. Yeah, it's a little too late for December. All right, so let's look at one day. Yeah. Hmm. This is it right here, maybe a little higher, nothing. The markets are definitely waiting for the GDP. And, it's, and, and again, in terms of the bond market, downtrend, more downside. I think interest rates are about to go a little higher, especially if US and China get things resolved and the long bond is already looking forward. Remember, interest rates going higher, bonds going lower. Um, over the long term, I think we've priced in the majority of our interest rate drop right here. Right here, this was the peak and we've been going down. Feds have been lowering rates and bonds have been going down. So the long bond, 10, 20, 30 year bond, which 10, 20, 30, they track each other almost 100%. They're saying, nope, that's it, Fed, we're done. You keep lowering rates, but we're gonna go down. So that's what causes that inverse, inverse curve. But again, I'm just, I'm giving you analysis that inverse curve is not that big of a deal right now. And the biggest factor right now is a short-term overbought level on the NASDAQ 100. I think that's gonna cause the technology sector to go south. Now, I got something for you. A lot of guys, a lot of guys, a lot of gals, a lot of traders, they like to buy stocks that are literally, literally buying stocks that Wall Street is about to put money into, 
all right? It's really easy to find the stock that Wall Street already put money into, but how about finding stocks that Wall Street is about to put their money into, all right? You don't need a crystal ball. You don't need a crystal ball, not even close. It's actually really, really simple. Hedge funds, algorithms can be very predictable if you know what to pay attention to. That's the key. You gotta know what to pay attention to. If you have a couple of charts and a couple of technical factors lining up, it can almost lead to certainty that you can be buying stocks that funds are about to get into. It really is simple. It's not that hard, all right? So there's a way to position yourself. Position yourself in stocks making massive tailwinds. And these stocks can often lead to large gains. Remember, there's nothing like following stocks that are about to be bought or are being bought by institutions. Imagine, just imagine for a second, a stock like IBM or Apple or Amazon, and you know ahead of time that a fund is gonna put billions of dollars into it, and you know when they're gonna do it. You could see markers, real, real markers. So I'm gonna teach you how to do that. It's not a coincidence. It's not a, uh, a, a uh, uh, you know, throwing darts type of thing. It has high probability, and I'm gonna teach you step-by-step step how to ride the tailcoats of large hedge funds, how to follow large hedge funds into the market when they're making a big move, how to get in front of them. So if you wanna learn this, and you do wanna learn this, especially with 2020 on the way, you gotta get in on this. Follow the link below, discover how hedge funds, how you can follow hedge funds into explosive stocks. If you can ride their coattails, if you can get that, if you can get that massive tailwind from a large hedge fund, you're golden. And a lot of what I do is measuring hedge fund institutions. So I made a video, check it out. It's The link is right below this video. You'll learn all about how to gain an edge and how to follow institutional money. It's, 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 not a, it's not a flip of a coin. There are indicators and tell signs that can help you do it the right way. I've said enough, follow the link below, learn how to do it. Learn to trade like a hedge fund, learn what hedge funds do, learn how to avoid getting into that trap and learn how you can follow them into the trade the right way and gain a big, big edge. Talk to you guys soon.